Uh, my name's Jeremy, and I'm um, leading the Monday night sessions this month. So welcome. Uh, so this month we are, um, well, I'm encouraging you to take a scientific approach to spiritual practice. And this is not a, a new idea. I think it's um, in keeping with the intent of the, the Buddha and the Buddha's tradition. And as I mentioned uh, a few weeks ago, the Buddha um, made the, uh, or advised his students to test everything he said, uh, as you would test gold before buying gold, that you should examine it by um, melting it, heating it and beating it and um, scratching it. And so I'm encouraging you to take that approach so what I mean by that is to be um, firstly sceptical about these ideas. So open-minded but sceptical. So don't accept them just because someone like the Buddha has said them. So that was what he was asking. And also to um, examine them thoroughly. So take a, uh, like a, a scientific approach, examine them thoroughly through um, your own reasoning and your own experience, so you try them out, um, try them on, wear them around, chew them over, and think about them thoroughly, and also good to discuss ideas with other people, and then they can challenge your ideas. So that's like the practice of debate, which is um, a central part of um, the education system and um, uh, Buddhist education institutions. So I'm encouraging that approach. And um, anything that I say, feel free to put up your hand and disagree. And then we can have a good discussion. And uh, people do that. That's fine. So I think uh, this approach is, is good. Um, because when you examine something thoroughly before you accept it, then I think it's much more firmly established in your mind. So, for example, um, in the first week we were talking about how um, external things are not able to provide um, definite or reliable happiness. They're not a reliable source of happiness. They can't provide the true happiness that we're looking for. So that's an idea that, or a hypothesis that we should test through our own experience and through reasoning and analysis and looking at other people's um, experience. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do. Anyway, firstly we'll do some meditation and we'll do the similar meditation to what we've done in the past two two weeks. And this is a concentration meditation, firstly. And the purpose of concentration meditation is to focus your mind on one single object without letting it wander. So normally our mind wanders from one mental object to the next, as I'm sure you're aware. And with each mental object we have sort of a reaction to that object, whether it be attraction to things that appear attractive, or aversion to things that appear unattractive, or a sort of neutral feeling to things that we haven't decided whether we like them or not. So at the end of the day, after our mind jumping from one mental object to the next in every moment, then that's why we get exhausted. So at the end of the day, our mind has been so busy jumping from one thing to the other. So being able to focus your mind on one neutral object is like giving your mind a holiday from that constant discursive process of jumping from one mental object to the other. So that's part of the benefit of focusing your mind. So this is the first uh, hypothesis that we can test, or one of them. So the idea is that if you focus your mind on one neutral object, then it will feel peaceful and calmer and also your body will as well. So we can test that through doing this meditation. 
Then also we'll do a visualization similar to we, what we've been doing the last two weeks. And this visualization is a meditation on compassion. And the idea of the purpose of doing a visualization like this is to familiarize our minds with the idea or the feeling or attitude of compassion. So changing our attitude towards people, the beings around us. So we'll do that and I'll just talk you through that. So firstly, just sit in a posture which you find comfortable but also conducive to remaining alert. So in meditation we're trying to be relaxed and not use a lot of force and keep your mind relaxed, your body relaxed, but also alert, awake. And it can help to think of your mind as vast and clear like the sky. So try and generate that expansive feeling of your mind being clear like the sky. And the thoughts that come into your mind is just being like clouds that are passing through your mind, through the clear expansiveness of your mind. And then it can help to let go of thinking about all the things that you have going on in your life. Let go of all the work concerns and relationship concerns. So just give yourself a break from those. So once your mind and body are a bit relaxed, then turn your attention to your breath. So without using force, you place your attention just on the breath moving in and out. So we use mindfulness, in this context it means remembering the object, so keeping the object in mind. So in this meditation the object is your breath. So we're keeping that object in mind without losing it. I find it helpful to focus on the point just under the tip of your nose. Focus on the breath moving in and out past that point. So you can try that. So mindfulness is keeping the object in mind and alertness is the other main faculty that we need to use here which is observing the concentration to see whether your mind has wandered or whether it's staying on the object. So that's called alertness or introspection, which is just observing your concentration. And then as soon as it starts to wander, then you bring it back to the object. So just try to keep your mind on that point on the breath for the duration of nine breaths. Breathing in and out is one breath.
Then at the end of nine breaths, you check to see whether your mind has wandered. Check also that you're keeping your mind relaxed and your body relaxed and that you're not tensing up or worrying too much about your concentration. So if your mind wanders off, you don't need to worry about that, you just place it back and remind yourself of mindfulness and alertness. So again, try to place your mind on the object for the duration of nine breaths. Then again, check your concentration. If your mind has wandered, just bring it back. Let go of those things that uh, you're thinking about. And for a final round of nine breaths, try to keep your mind placed. Remaining very alert to your mind wandering. Again for nine breaths. Okay, so now we'll do the visualization. So visualize it as you're breathing in, that you're breathing in white or golden light, whichever you prefer, or a mixture of both. And that this uh, light is completely filling your mind and body. And that this light represents enlightened compassion and wisdom. So it's like perfect compassion and wisdom. And that it completely fills your mind and body. So every atom of your body, every corner of your mind. And that as you breathe out, you're expelling any problems or pain or afflictive emotions 
anything that's bothering you, physical or mental pain, discomfort, just visualize that that's being completely expelled in the form of dark light. So again, this process is relaxed and you keep your mind clear and spacious, calm, and you don't need to force your mind. So just focus for a few minutes on that visualization, breathing in light, white, uh, golden light and breathing out dark light. So then you feel that all of your uh, problems have been completely removed by doing this purification and that your mind and body are completely pervaded by this blissful light energy. And then you visualize that this uh, light energy, enlightened wisdom and compassion energy is radiating out from your heart, going out to all the beings in the universe. So you can start small and gradually expand it, if you like. So you start with the, the being, people in this room, for example, or with your closest family and friends, or your pet cat, or dog, or turtle. And just gradually expand it out to include as many beings as you can. So feel that the, this wisdom energy, this blissful energy is completely pervading their mind and body, removing all of their, even the tiniest suffering, tiniest discomfort. And then also focus on the people that you don't like, the people who cause you problems. Or they could be public figures like politicians or people on television. So that anyone who makes you feel uncomfortable, who you dislike. So you imagine, you think that in the same way as as you also want to be happy and to avoid suffering, they also are exactly the same. So you feel that, you visualize that they are also filled with this blissful energy. So then you can develop this um, visualization or this practice further by visualizing that you're actually giving away your own blissful wisdom and compassion energy. You're actually giving it away, all of it. 
So visualize that the light is actually leaving you and going out to all other beings. So you're not holding any back for yourself, you're actually giving it all away. So this is a practice of generosity and compassion and uh, selfless love. So you end the meditation by visualizing that all other beings have achieved a state of complete freedom from all suffering, a permanent state. So end the meditation there. Yes, sorry. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, so, j just to repeat your question, you're saying that it seems a bit ridiculous to do a visualization where you imagine visualizing you're breathing in uh, enlightened uh, wisdom and compassion. Yeah. I yeah. Feel mm. but, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's fine, that's fine. So firstly, I'd just say that it is a visualization. So, so I'm not saying that you're actually going to achieve wisdom by breathing in, imagine, imagining that you're breathing in wisdom. So it's not, it's not, uh, it's, it's not making that claim. So I think the purpose of this kind of visualization is, as, as you say, to get your mind used to the idea of compassion. So I think one of the problems that we have with practicing compassion is we lack a certain amount of confidence or, or courage. So I think, um, and we feel like, oh, I'm not really a compassionate person. That's not really me. I don't think I'm capable of compassion. We, I think we tend to have those kind of doubts. So I think a practice like this can be very useful in just giving us that kind of familiarity in our mind with the idea of, of compassion and of giving. And also, understanding that that, that that practice and that attitude is actually an enjoyable one. So you get used to the feeling of, I could actually be more kind and giving and generous, and I, would, I might actually enjoy that. And it might actually be something that, you know, that I could develop. So I think that's the idea of a... It's because the, the whole idea of um, meditation is familiarizing your mind with, with an attitude, with, with an idea. So, yeah. So um, the idea of wisdom there, I think, is, it's, I think, probably symbolic, you would say, because um, in the Buddhist path particularly, and, and in other spiritual traditions, the main two things we're trying to develop are wisdom and compassion. And those two themes come up all the time. So I think it's a way of, of getting used to the idea or reminding yourself of, of that is what we're trying to achieve. So I think it's, it's not really any more than that. But um, and it, and it would be combined with other practices which you are using to develop wisdom. So, like the analysis we've been doing in our meditations, where you analyze 
an idea or a thought, that, that's a more practical way of developing wisdom. I think you could probably see that. And, and understanding how some thoughts are based on wrong ideas is a way of developing wisdom. But anyway, that's, I, I, I appreciate that. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not saying that you will develop wisdom just by visualizing breathing in wisdom. That's a bit like sleeping on a book when, and hoping that you're going to wake up being able to speak Spanish. Or <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not saying that. All right, so we'll move on. Um, all right, so that's um, developing concentration. And hopefully you get some uh, idea or some feeling that when you can focus your mind on a, on a neutral or positive object that you develop that, you develop some uh, clarity and I think more peaceful state of mind. I think it, it comes through, through practice, I think at first it will can probably feel quite strange but then slowly it becomes um, more familiar and your mind just sort of can rest more in that, in that practice. Yeah. So I think you get the idea of concentration. And also important to understand mindfulness, remembering the object, and alertness, which is observing the concentration to see whether the mind has wandered or not. So they're good to understand those two as well. Okay, so what we're, where we're up to with our discussion on this practice of scientific approach to spiritual practice. So I was thinking we could um, think, um, so normally like for scientists they would have like a professor or a supervisor, research supervisor. So you could think of the Buddha as being like the, the professor. And so if you went to, to this Buddha professor and said, I want to analyze um, how to be happy and to, to avoid suffering, what, and, and so, so where should I start? So in the first week this month we were talking about how um, external things, things that are external to the mind are not a reliable um, source of happiness and analyzing that. So I think that the Buddha might say that you should firstly check up like where are you looking for happiness? So normally we look for happiness in external things, as in external things that are external to the mind as opposed to internal. So that's like the first hypothesis, that external things are not going to provide the true happiness that we're looking for. So that was the first thing that we were discussing. So let's say we accept that for the reasons that we were talking about, that, they, that because they're separate to the mind, they can't be a necessary or true cause for that happiness which is a mental phenomena that was one of the one of the reasons so let's say we accept that and that would be quite a, a big change in our attitude to look for happiness you know solely within our mind so then uh, if you turn inwards and look at your mind then as we we're saying last week there's so many so much going on in your mind there's so much so many different thoughts and, and emotions and feelings ideas, concepts, beliefs, attitudes. And so it's difficult to know where to start. What is it within your mind that is causing problems and what is, what is useful? So then we need some way of, of investigating and analyzing. So then the Buddha might say, well, I, I would suggest that you look at uh, attachment and aversion. That would be a next hypothesis you could, you could um, investigate. So last week we were talking about attachment and aversion and how the problems that attachment causes and, and what attachment is. So attachment is um, exaggerating the importance of something and then wanting to hold onto it, grasp it, consume it. So whether that's a person or a thing or a substance or food. So that's attachment and aversion. And aversion is the, is the other side of that where you're exaggerating the negative qualities of something and wanting to push it away. So whether that's a person, we see a person as 
somehow um, truly negative and then we want to push them away or we remove ourselves from them. So the idea here is that these qualities of good and bad are projected by our minds onto the object. So that's again something we need to investigate, whether those things, qualities are coming from the side of the object or whether they're projections um, by our mind onto the object. So for example, if, if someone you dislike was truly uh, inherently unpleasant, then everybody else would see them as unpleasant. But often you see that's not the case, that someone you dislike, there's someone else who thinks that they're great. So that's evidence that the way you're seeing them is projected by your mind. So that's attachment and aversion we were talking about last week. Okay, so then let's say you accept that attachment and aversion are a problem, that we need to reduce those in order to and that they are causing us problems. I mean, so we reduce those, then those problems will um, diminish. For example, uh, conflict in your relationship with others, anger, irritation, um, frustration because of wanting things that you're not able to achieve, or depression because you can't achieve what you want, those kind of things. They're all coming from attachment and aversion. And also general sort of mental um, disturbance, mental sort of lack of peace. I think when we investigate we see that that is also coming from our minds being pulled constantly between attachment and aversion, sort of being drawn towards this object and trying to push this one away. There's a famous um, Buddhist saint called Shantideva who said that we have a choice, we can either try to um, cover the whole surface of the earth in leather or otherwise we could just put leather on the soles of our feet. So they're saying it's much easier just to put leather on the soles of our feet. So the idea there is that instead of trying to control the whole world and put, bring all the nice things in and push all the unpleasant things away and be constantly trying to control the external world which is by nature you know, beyond our control and, and so being constantly in, in conflict with to the world and having this exhausting, uh, exhausting pursuit, exhausting goal, I'm not sure what the word is. Um, so we can just look at our mind and change our mind. So we can reduce the attachment and aversion and overcome the problems that way. So the mind is something we have more control over. Not a lot. If we try and meditate, we can see that we don't have a huge amount of control over our mind, but through practice we can gain more control through familiarity. When your mind becomes very familiar with an idea, it's much easier to put it into practice. So that's what meditation is, familiarizing our mind. There's one teacher who says that Buddhism basically is just a, a long, um, prolonged exercise in realism. So what we're doing, and again this is the idea of a scientific analysis, we're just trying to investigate objects to see whether the qualities we're seeing in them are, are really there or whether we're projecting them onto them. That's one of the things we're trying to investigate. So we're trying to be completely realistic about things and people. Okay, so let's say you accept that attachment and aversion are a problem as we were t discussing last week. Um, so then if you went back to your professor of the border and said, okay, I've checked out attachment aversion, I agree that they're a problem and I'm going to um, subdue them by seeing that there's good and bad qualities are projected by the mind. So then I've subdued the attachment and aversion. So then the next um, thing that the Buddha might say is that you need to understand why the attachment and aversion arise in the first place. Why do we have this habit of projecting good qualities onto things and bad qualities onto things? So the next thing he might say to investigate, he or, or she, they're also female Buddhas, um, that uh, these things arise out of a self-centered view. So I'm reluctant to use the word selfishness. Um, it's sort of, I think when I say selfishness, you feel like you're sort of being scolded, like when your mother told you, don't be so selfish. 
So it has very, I think, negative connotations. So it's not a, a value judgment at all. We're just saying that when the mind is focused on just primarily on this self, that it creates a lot of problems. Okay, so that could be the next hypothesis we examine, that self-centeredness is causing us problems. And the opposite of self-centeredness is the attitudes of love and compassion. So in this context, love means the wish um, that others be happy, or the wish to make others happy. That's what we mean by love in this context. And compassion is the other side of that, is wishing others to be free of suffering or, or to do something to relieve their suffering. So that's love and compassion. They're the definitions we're talking about. Um, so love and compassion are the direct antidotes to the self-centered mind, also sometimes called self-cherishing in Buddhist terminology. Again, I think maybe that's not the best translation because self-cherishing sounds like a good thing, like taking care of yourself, which is a good thing. But here we're talking about us sort of exaggerating the importance of this self. And then, so self-cherishing, it would be like seeing the self as the most important thing in your universe. And even more problematic is seeing the self as more important than other people. Or seeing the welfare of this self as more important than others' welfare. So then you take that to the nth, to the extreme view, then you would get sort of, you know, megalomaniacs and... Uh, tyrants, people who think it's okay to, to kill lots of people. So that would be the extreme of self-cherishing where the, the, they're like, the whole universe is just their self. They're kind of trapped in just this idea of self and that's basically all that there is in their universe. So to, uh, to start to tackle um, uh, overcoming self-centered view and developing love and compassion I think we need to be very clear about the problems of self-centered view, selfishness, and the advantages of love and compassion. So I think a, a simple way of understanding that is to look at the various problems, difficulties we experience in our lives and see how they relate to how they arise from this self-centered view. So for example, um, we were talking about attachment and aversion. So they arise because the self, um, the preoccupation with the self, then there's this arising, this feeling of wanting always to make the self happy and to avoid anything which is unpleasant or threatening or um, not in accordance with what the, this self wants. So then we give arise, so anything that appears to be uh, attractive, then we want to bring it in, own it, possess it, consume it, and anything which is threatening, harmful, unpleasant, we want to sort of push it away or keep distant from it. So you can see how all these feelings are like arising from this sense of self. So at the center of this universe you have this self and then all these actions and thoughts are aimed at protecting it, bringing out the best outcome always for the, for the self. Yeah, I think you're raising a few uh, important points there. So if, um, one, I'll just pick out a couple. One is that the self needs certainty, and I think probably we can all relate to that. And then you're also saying that the self needs to be, how did you say it, on, on top, or needs to be... The self, yeah, the self needs to think that it's... It's on, yeah. It, it's on top because it, it needs to guard itself against uncertainty. 
I got to get, yeah, right, okay. Yeah, so f I think, not yeah. So not so moralizing, yeah. No, I think that's, there's some good points you're making. Um, so I, I think we all agree that we like certainty and find uncertainty um, threatening to, more, to varying degrees. And so it's good to think about, you know, why that is. And, and also, I think we can see how that does arise out of a, a sort of pre, a concern for the self. And so I think that's similar to the idea of attachment and aversion where certainty is kind of safe. So we want the sort of safer situation for the self. And so uncertain is unsafe. So we tend to sort of steer away from things that are uncertain and towards things that are certain. But then your other point about how the self always needs to be on top or in control maybe, or in charge of the universe. So I think in one way you can see how that, that idea is true in that we need to take responsibility for our own experience and our own lives. But then on the other hand, if we have this sort of like obsessive or ex um, extreme view of the self, that it's creating a lot of problems, which actually, you know, means that we lose control of our, of our lives. So you think of relationships, for example. So to have a good relationship with someone, then you need to have things like empathy, you need to understand their situation. And having a s strong feeling of I gets in the way of that. So if you're preoccupied with your own needs and wants, it gets in the way of um, empathizing with them, sharing with them, and having the uh, generosity or patience or um, sort of open-mindedness where you can uh, allow for their, for their needs, you know, what, what they want, what they need. So you see that in your, in your relationship with people and how this sense of self gets in the way of having that sort of closeness where you sort of can let go of, what, of, your, of your needs in order to um, be able to give them what they want. So that's something we all experience all the time in our relationships, isn't it? Um, yes, sorry. I, I see a, a relationship with what you're speaking about. Mm. Starting from the meditation itself, where it helps one focus as well, and the empathic listening. Mm. Which Uh, all the time. So, so you're, you're just saying now something very critical uh, that uh, empathy, uh, and that can work with your enemy as well. Mm -hmm. because, uh, the enemy is the enemy because there's some sort of conflict in, in ideas and, and uh, we don't like each other. However, mm -hmm. uh, empathic listening and focusing, so we've got the meditation, the training, and being able to focus on what you're saying to me, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And did everyone hear that? Do I, need, I don't need to repeat that. Yeah. So I think, as you say, you can clearly see how the uh, this selfish concern or self-centeredness gets in the way of that. So it's very hard to empathise with someone when you're busy thinking about yourself. So it might just, you know, they start talking about their problems and you think, oh, I really don't want to hear about your problems, I've got my own problems. And it's just kind of like making, bringing me down sort of thing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so 
this is a problem we all have with our relationships. And, and so the idea is that we're trying to um, reduce that selfish concern, that preoccupation with the self, what I want, what I need, and increase their concern for others. And so we're trying to reduce one and increase the other. So these practices are aim, aimed at doing that. In fact, I think you could say that that is probably the purpose of religion. If someone said, what is the purpose of religion or spiritual traditions? And you could say that is probably the main purpose, I think, is to reduce this selfishness and increase empathy, compassion, love for others. I mean, there's more to it than that. But and something what mm. the lady on the said about uh, I think from the Buddhist point of view, something like psychedelics would fall into the category of like, like medicine. So, so, I mean, it's a, probably a dangerous medicine, like you need to be very skillful if you were trying to use it for therapeutic purposes. But it would, so distinct from the practice of meditation. So obviously medicine can be helpful. It is, you know, we, we all get benefit from medicine, medicine. But these are physical substances which we use um, you know, to help our mind and body. And again, they're external. So the Buddhist view would be that those things can be beneficial in the same way that food is beneficial to a, to a point, but they're not going to provide, they're not capable of providing this sort of, um, you know, lasting, uh, reliable happiness that, that we're searching for. So that would be kind of the, the Buddhist view. Again, something you need to check out in your own experience. If, 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 you, <laughs> if you're feeling courageous, I wouldn't recommend it. Yes. Do you have any advice on working on compassion fatigue? Because obviously that's an element that can creep into, like if um, you're looking after a loved one or something like that, that can Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So compassion fatigue, and I think that's something that's um, discussed a lot. I think also in sort of caring professions, you know, like um, nursing and counselling. So um, I think that's something we all experience. You know, there are all there are times when we just don't feel compassionate towards people. You know, we try hard, no matter how hard we try, it's just like we're, we need space. So then, then I think you need to be very realistic about your own mind, your own capacity. And so these are um, attitudes that we are trying to develop and we can develop them further through practice, through familiarization, but it takes time to develop them and so we have limitations, so we need to be realistic about our limitations. And if it gets to a point where, you know, being with someone is too difficult, you can't feel compassion, you're only feeling irritation, anger towards them, and you need to take a break from that situation, give yourself peace and space to calm your mind down, and then when you can, return to that practice of compassion. You know, and it may even involve you know distancing yourself from from that person. So we have to be entirely realistic 
as I was saying before, it's a it's a process of realism, including being realistic about our own limitations. And I think that's one of the things that we find hardest to accept is our own limitations. But but fighting against those, or feeling guilty, or feeling frustrated, or feeling um, embarrassed about them is uh, is not helpful. So. Again, that's sort of like the scientific approach where you look at your mind and you try and be objective and you try not to sort of be too scared of what's going on in your mind. So if you're feeling anger towards somebody, you don't sort of freak out and say, oh my God, that's so terrible and I'm feeling angry towards my mother who's been so kind to me. <laughs> so anger just arises because of there's causes and conditions, you know. There's a reason why it comes up. So you need to look at the, what are the reasons why is anger arising now? Instead of feeling, oh, this is terrible, I'm a terrible person. And, um, so again, it's one of being objective, being analytical, being um, non-judgmental, and examining carefully, closely, and yeah, being realistic about how it takes time and you need to gradually develop your mind. Did that answer your question? <laughs> so be, being kind to yourself and patient with yourself is also important. Okay. So we've talked about the definitions of love and compassion, definitions of selfishness or self-cherishing, um, the benefits of love and compassion, which is mostly that it at least for ourself, is that it overcomes the self, self-centeredness. Um, obviously, if you've developed love and compassion, then you're more able to help others in various ways. But um, it has the benefit for ourself of reducing self-centeredness and also all the problems that arise from self-centeredness, such as um, anger, attachment, jealousy, and all the you know related problems. So I think this is something that's just possibly not well understood, is that the benefits of practicing love and compassion is initially mostly going to benefit yourself because it's a direct antidote to these attitudes of self-centeredness. So the Dalai Lama calls it intelligent selfishness. So he says if you want to be really look after yourself, if you really want to look after this one person the best in the best way, then you should practice love and compassion, because that is the best and easiest way to achieve um, bliss, to achieve happiness. So that's kind of a joke, but, he, but it's also true. So then, uh, how do we develop love and compassion? We've talked about that a bit. So the main um, practice is as we were saying before, is firstly empathy, to see how they are in this, it's very similar to us in that they are wanting to be happy and to be free of problems. So that's the first step, is to seeing how all others are almost identical to us in that way. So every moment of their life, they're trying to achieve happiness, trying to re remove problems. So that's the first step, that kind of identifying that sort of sameness, how they're not different from us in that fundamental way. So that's like the foundation, um, develop a sort of uh, warm, uh, sharing, kind of close feeling with, with other people, saying that they're just like me, they're not that different from me. And then by understanding the various problems that they experience, so you can investigate you know, and think about your because we have this tendency to think that I'm the only one who's experiencing this problem. I mean, we know that's not true, but we have that, tend to have that kind of feeling. And so when you investigate, then you see that other people have all these things going on in their lives that we didn't realize. So it's, a, again, an analytical approach to investigate the kind of experiences people are having, the various difficulties they're having. And I think you can see how just focusing on those, instead of fo focusing on this self and all my problems, my difficulties, this, this problem I'm having, this person's doing this to me and they're not 
not giving me what I want, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can see by letting go of that and just focusing on others is kind of like immediately freeing yourself, freeing your mind from all that kind of self-centered um, anxiety, self-centered kind of problems that are constantly going on in our mind. It sort of steps out of that. So one of the there's two main traditions taught in Buddhism for developing what's called bodhicitta, which is the like the sort of most developed form of love and compassion. And so this one of them is called exchanging self for others. So it's like that idea where in, instead of having this focus on the self and looking after the self all the time, you exchange that for looking after others. So it's just sort of like swapping 180 degrees. So maybe we can do that just for a minute. I just want you to just think about this idea of self, of self-cherishing or selfishness, thinking of I and wanting this I to be happy, being concerned about the I and wanting all the best things for this self and wanting to push away all the things that are unpleasant or unhelpful. And how we've been constant, been doing this for for a long time, constantly looking for happiness for this self. Even in our dreams, we're seeking happiness for this self. So the idea of exchanging self for others is to just swap that. So instead of looking always for the happiness of the self, to exchange that for looking for happiness for others. So you can immediately, your mind is sort of turned outwards and looking at other beings. So immediately it's much more expansive and vast. So you can start with the people you're closest to and just think about just wishing them to be happy in the same way you normally wish for yourself to be happy. So wanting them to have all the best things and to avoid all the, even the tiniest problems. And then you sort of try and expand that out to include more and more people. So then when a problem arises in your mind, something that's bothering you, like something that someone said or something you're worried about at work or you know, your health problem you're worried about, money problem, etc. So in, instead of worrying about those and dwelling on them, then you just think about the other people in the world or around you who are experiencing the similar problems. And so you focus on on what, on their issue instead of your issue. So then you might start to get this feeling like it's a bit frightening, like if I stop worrying about myself and looking after myself and defending myself, then, then I, you know, I'm going to it's like dangerous or something bad's going to happen to me or I'm not going to be able to survive or cope. So that's, that feeling is something we need to analyze whether that's, that's true, whether we do actually need to have these kind of constantly, constant thoughts about the self and looking after the self or whether we can let go of those. We might actually be happier if we let go of those and focus on others. Okay, so we're kind of out of time, so I'll just end the meditation there. So I think you get the idea of exchanging self for others, and the idea that this selfish, self-centered attitude is, does give rise to a lot of these problems, and we can remove those problems by focusing our mind on others' welfare. I think you got that idea. Anyway, so that's the idea that we're we need to check up in our experience, in our analysis. So try that during the week. 
The Dalai Lama says that there's no logical reason to cherish oneself more than others. So that's also a provocative idea. Normally you would say it's logical to look after yourself more than others. But he's saying actually there's no logical reason why you should cherish yourself more than others. One of the reasons is because this person is one and others are many. Sorry. <laughs> why look after one when there are others are many? Other reason is looking after this self solely and forgetting about others is actually causing a lot of problems for the self. So it doesn't make sense in that regard. Anyway, thank you very much for listening and uh, good luck with that practice. Uh, let me know how you go. Thanks. <laughs>